Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I'm Susan Axelrod, Editor-in-Chief of Culture, and I'm in the wine room at Cheval Restaurant in Portland, Maine for Uncork Your Potential. This three-part wine education series is hosted by Culture in partnership with King Estate Winery. And our presenter is the extremely knowledgeable and entertaining Maya Goslin of Sip Wine Education. A few housekeeping details before we get started. Please ask your questions using the chat feature. We will have a 10 minute Q&A session at the end of the presentation. And if you have any overarching wine questions, general knowledge wine questions, please feel free to email me, editor at culturecheesemag.com, and I'll pass these along to Maya, who will answer them in our third session. Now, King Estate Winery, our partner for these, these three educational sessions, is a beautiful estate in Eugene, Oregon, where the King family has been making award-winning wines since 1991. It is the largest certified biodynamic winery in North America, and this brief video will give you an introduction. After the video, Maya will take it away. Thanks again for being here. People are looking for things that are better. They want better choices. They want to make better decisions about their food and the way they live. And I think biodynamics is going to deliver that to people. King Estate, as a winery, believes in doing the right thing and setting a good example, that it has an impact far beyond our boundaries. And uh, it's a message that is important in the world today. Biodynamics takes things to a different level. It, it turns itself away from monoculture, looks holistically at the entire state, and it judges the uh, diversity and the integration of a lot of different components. As an example, what we're doing says that it's possible, it's feasible, and, and yes, everybody can do it. And that's the important piece of this, and giving people a different path away from chemical industrial farming. Sometimes great changes come from small examples. Um, again, my name is Maya Goslin, and I own Sip Wine Education. Um, I work with a range of, of uh, groups. So I'm just going to give you a quick overview as to how I teach. I work with retail stores. I work with restaurants. Um, I work with corporate groups, private groups, and I work with senior living uh, retirement communities because um, they like to drink wine and have fun and learn about it too. The content may change in terms of what I'm teaching, but the approach is still the same. Every time I teach, I aim to demystify wine. I want to make it fun and friendly with no pretentiousness in there. I find that um, for anybody, no matter who you are, uh, intimidation can be a real stumbling block when it comes to learning about wine. Um, and there's nothing worse than feeling, um, feeling that way when it comes to learning about something so fabulous as wine, because really it shouldn't be snobby. Um, too many people make it that way. So we're gonna go about today, uh, we're going to be doing sort of a wine 101 building blocks today so that when we do sessions two and three, you'll have some of these more fundamental tools. Before I get to the beginning, I wanna make a quick note. I sent along some wine and cheese recommendations. Um, what I didn't say was you should probably, and you have a little bit of time if you're in your home or you're in your workplace, to grab some water crackers, um, any kind of um, crostini or anything that is not flavored or herbed, just a plain carb that I'm gonna ask you to have right before we do the wine and cheese tasting. Um, tasting wine later in the day, although it's fun to do, isn't the optimal time. Um, I love to tell my groups that the best time of day to taste wine is 8 a.m. Um, because your palate is at its sharpest. Um, not all of us can justify that, but the next time you're contemplating that glass of sparkling wine with breakfast, um, you heard it from me that, that you will taste it the best at 8 in the morning. So when we get to that, uh, you have some time uh, if you want to go grab that. So we're going to start off I think one of the core concepts that is really important to understand when it comes to wine education is the old world versus new world philosophy. So this is really two unique ways of approaching wine philosophy, wine making, wine tasting, wine appreciation. And it is as it sounds, new world wine countries would be the United States, New Zealand. Um, in South America, it would be Chile and Argentina. It would be South Africa. Um, and then old world, of course, is primarily uh, Italy, Spain, France, uh, Greece, 
parts of South Africa as well, Portugal. These are countries where the winemaking has been there for centuries longer than the New World. But one of the big differences is that in the New World, winemaking is more focused on the winemaker, on, um, on research, DNA testing, cloning, uh, much more on social media, on marketing, and a fundamental belief that a winemaker is the person who creates the, way, the wine to taste the way that it does. So New World winemaking sort of operates under a philosophy that I can plant my vineyard here and I can manipulate conditions, I can create a climate, I can control everything, and I can actually duplicate that 250 miles away and create a wine that has the same flavor profile. Old world winemaking is much more rooted in heritage, in tradition, and in this concept called terroir. So terroir is this idea that the soil, the climate, a variety of the vines themselves, these components come together to create a sense of place, a sense of taste, so that when you drink this wine, you're drinking the place that it comes from. So it's most fam the most famous region in the world, of course, would be Burgundy for this, but the idea is that the winemaker isn't necessarily the most important factor when it comes to the wine, but the terroir, the climate, all these other conditions that come together and soil plays a huge role in this. Now, these days we're seeing sort of um, a melding of the philosophies where old world and new world are meeting and everybody's happy now. Um, you definitely have some old world winemakers that have come over to the United States and brought their philosophies with them and they've been embraced here and vice versa. You're seeing a little bit of the new world sort of seeping in um, to the old world ways because you can't always do everything in the old world style. You have to sort of move along with the times sometimes. <laughs> but um, I usually say that when you pull a cork out of an old world bottle of wine, you're going to have some sort of information about the winery on it, mise en bouteille à la propriété, um, versus a cork from a new world winery might have a follow us on Instagram or here's our hashtag. So usually those are, those are kind of like core fundamentals right there. Um, so then the second part of this, of course, is, is another concept that's the region versus the grapes. And this is sort of an old world, new world philosophy as well. New world winemaking identifies its wines by the grape's name. So in America, we drink a Chardonnay. That's the name of the grape. You drink a Cabernet Sauvignon. That's the name of the grape. You don't drink the place. You don't drink a Napa. You don't drink a Sonoma. You don't drink a Willamette Valley. Um, we don't have those differentials. Now in old world, in France primarily, definitely in Italy and some of Spain, as well as some other regions, they identify their wine by the place. So for instance, if you're drinking Sancerre, that's an appellation in the Loire Valley. If it's white, by definition, it's Sauvignon Blanc. So some of the core ones to know would be Champagne is the first. So I'm just gonna show you, I'm a big fan of maps. Hopefully there's not too much of a glare. This is France. Right up here, I'm just gonna to point to it. You don't really need to see it. That's Champagne. Champagne is a place. It's not just a style of sparkling wine, it's an appellation. It's a controlled, regulated area. There are specific grapes that are allowed to be used in the cuvee for Champagne. The three primary ones are Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Pinot Meunier. There are four others that can be used. Um, some are grandfather clause in, but those are the primary ones. A Blanc de Blanc, Champagne is 100% Chardonnay. But Champagne itself is a place. And uh, when actually when I get to talking about sparkling wine, I'll go into the Champagne versus everybody else a little bit more in a little bit more detail. So then you have the Sancerre, that's the Sauvignon Blanc. There are other appellations in the Loire Valley as well that are identified by their place name, not the grape. Um, Burgundy is another really big one to know. If you are drinking red Burgundy, you are drinking Pinot Noir. If you are drinking white Burgundy, you are drinking Chardonnay. If you're drinking Chablis, if you're drinking Macon, if you're drinking uh, Petit Chablis, all of those are Chardonnay. They are produced in different parts of this region and the, the terroir in each of those places is so unique and so influential that when you taste these wines, you know you taste it, you know what you're drinking. Um, Bordeaux, another great one. So Bordeaux is left bank and right bank driven. 
um, Merlot or Cabernet Sauvignon would be the dominant two grapes. And then you can have four other grapes in there as well. Chenin Blanc is a favorite of mine. That is a grape that we love in America. Chenin Blanc also grows beautifully in South Africa. But if you're drinking Chenin Blanc and it's from France, it's Vouvray if it's in the Loire Valley. So Vouvray is the appellation and the style of Chenin Blanc is very different than the style of Chenin Blanc um, that's in South Africa or the United States. So the grape itself, grapes have this unique, beautiful ability to take on the characteristics of where they grow. The four core ones that I would probably pay the most attention to would be Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Cabernet Sauvignon. And I just briefly touched on those, but there are myriad grapes. There are more grapes than I can ever even begin to count. Um, but those are sort of the big core four, in my opinion, in terms of maybe thinking about the philosophy of your store and wines that you, styles that you would definitely want to have in there. For Italian wines, um, they also follow this philosophy as well, the, the region versus the grape. Uh, Brunello di Montalcino, that's Sangiovese. Chianti, also in Appalachian, those are in Tuscany. Um, Sangiovese is the grape that goes into that too. Uh, Barolo is Nebbiolo. These are all famous wines that we sort of just, we hear the name and we know what, that they signify something special, something classic, but oftentimes the realization isn't there that it's you're drinking the place, not necessarily the grape. Um, and there are some areas in Spain, um, which is famous for Riojas, which is an appellation, Spain and other parts of Italy where you just drink a grape. Um, in Italy, you can drink Pinot Grigio. That's the name of a grape. You can drink uh, Gavi, or you can drink um, uh, Nero d'Avola or Frappato. Those are all grapes. But for the most part, the historic heritage ones are, are the ones I was mentioning. And it goes a little bit deeper than just drinking a place. These regions are regulated. They're regulated in that they can't make an unlimited amount of this wine. They have to follow the governing areas, the governing board um, that makes these determinations. They have to follow all their rules and laws. And there are certificates, there are codes, there are a variety of uh, differential uh, differences on labels that you would see for these different wines. There are crews, Grand Crews, Parmier Crews. There are different uh, tiers of, of uh, classifications as well. And you don't have that in America or in the new world for the most part. Uh, what you might find is this is a reserve or this is um, a grand reserve for specific wines or it's a single vineyard. Um, those are also very informative on labels, but that those are sort of some really big differences for the old world versus the new world. I tend to be more old world in my overall, you know, what, what I gravitate to, but um, I, in particular in the United States, um, Oregon right now is very similar to old world in its climate to France, actually to Burgundy. And I find that I really kind of um, have a natural preference for those styles of wines. So that's sort of a, a brief overview of those you know, kind of core concepts. Um, but if I was suggesting some hidden gems, dynamic regions and countries that I would also recommend that you be on the lookout for in terms of wine, I'm going to suggest um, sparkling wines from anywhere because they're just so incredibly popular. Unoaked Chardonnays. Um, oak versus unoaked is, it tr plays a tremendously big role in how you taste Chardonnay. And I will actually get to that a little bit later. Um, Greece right now, Sicily right now um, are producing, and South Africa are all areas that you should really be keeping an eye on for some really fun, dynamic, interesting wines uh, that aren't mass marketed. So that's one of the other aspects that I was talking about when I was referencing the, the restrictions on how much old world wine countries can produce or these regions. Um, mainstream wines, mass marketed wines, when you produce an unlimited amount of wine, Although the consumer may demand it, you know, everybody wants their X wine that's the super popular wine of the moment. The more you make of anything, the, the faster you turn over your fields, the, your, your yields are so high, the quality diminishes over time and it happens pretty quickly. And then the wine just sort of has a generic profile to it. When you have a very small amount, when you release a thousand cases or you have a really strict limit on how much you can produce, 
quality stays. And if anything, it increases. So that's something that I'm seeing in these other, those areas that I just mentioned, these little beautiful lines coming out of Greece and Sicily right now. Um, really dynamic, really fun, and um, definitely something to keep an eye on. And when we talk about working with your wine reps in the next class, we'll circle back to, to that part. So <clears throat> those are some core, core concepts. Now I'm gonna just sort of jump over to what right now I'm seeing that's trendy. Because I think these are important. You may not want to be on trend. Um, you may want to set yourself apart as being, you know, not having the current big thing. But you will have customers coming in regardless um, who are looking for those. Even if they're looking for a specific wine and cheese pairing, uh, they're probably going to be looking for some impulse purchases as well. And having those sort of hot wines, the, the popular trends that are happening right now, is something I would definitely recommend. So tiny bubbles equal big sales, hearkening back to the sparkling wine. There's champagne, there's Prosecco, which is a powerhouse. And then I think most people just sort of think that it's just those two. Prosecco is always Italian. It primarily comes from Northern Italy, from, from Veneto, but it can come from some other small areas as well. And as I mentioned before, champagne comes from the Champagne area of France. And then in between you have myriad different styles. You've got Cava's, you have Cremant's, which are also French, Brichetto's, Lambrusco's, um, any number, and then domestic American sparkling wine. So sparkling wine is a term that references wine that has gone through two fermentations. Still wine has gone through one fermentation, sparkling wine has gone through two. How it gets its second fermentation is one of the big differentials between Prosecco and Champagne. So Prosecco is, um, goes through its second fermentation in a giant stainless steel vat, a huge tank. Um, it is pressurized. Um, so you can make Prosecco in about six weeks. And the grape is different as well. The grape is called Glera. Sometimes it can have a little bit of Chardonnay in there, but again, Prosecco goes by its regional DOC name. DOC stands for Denominacion Origin Controllada. Um, so Prosecco's almost exclusively, this small percentage um, are bottle fermented, but for the most part, they're tank fermented. It's easier to produce Prosecco. You can make it very quickly. Um, it's not as expensive as making champagne, of course. So it's fun, it's fruity, it's bubbly, it's easy drinking, it's not complicated, and it has a little bit more sweetness to it. It's quaffable. It goes great on Sundays. It goes great in mimosas. Everybody loves Prosecco. I love Prosecco. Um, but on the other end, when you've got the champagne, now champagne goes through two fermentations that are in the bottle. Everything's done by hand in champagne for the most part. Uh, the term champagne, like I was saying, is proprietary. And some of you are probably thinking, well, how can only this one part of the world use that term when I know I've seen it on some other bottles? You're right. So um, wineries such as Corbel, Andre and Cook's, we're using the term champagne on their labels for so long before the um, regulations really began to be really enforced in the early 2000s that they were able to ask for a grandfather clause and they were granted it. So they were able to say like, look, this has been associated with our brand for so long that if you take that away from us, people will no longer affiliate us with this concept anymore. So they are allowed to use it. So just trust me, if it's in a bottle that has a plastic cork on it and it's $6.99, even if it says champagne on the label, it's not actual champagne. It doesn't say it comes from Champagne, France. So one other um, key point to sparkling wine in general is a term called brute. So brute equals dry. Dry is the absence of sweetness. When we drink most of the sparkling wine, especially most champagne, we're, we are used to drinking a brute style, but it actually means something more than that. It is an indicator of how much sugar is actually in the bottle itself. So there are, they are allowed to have, there's this, it's a global international scale. So brute is allowed to have zero to 12 grams of residual sugar per liter. On average, I would say it's around six grams. So that is dry. You don't have any sort of like hint of sweetness in your mouth. Um, brute, extra brute and brute nature have less and less sugar. I mean, that's like bone dry, but the term extra dry, and this is incredibly confusing because this is why 
people make rules and then exceptions to the rules. Dry and extra dry are actually sweeter. So if it says on the bottle of Prosecco, if it says this is extra dry, it's going to have more sugar. It can have between 12 to 17 grams of sugar. So when you drink, if you're in this shop and you're looking at a bottle of extra dry Prosecco and you would rightly say, this is extra dry, but then you drink it and you think this has a hint of sweetness. The reason is, is because extra dry is sweeter than brut, which is dry. And if you got all that, excellent. <laughs> I have learned it over time. I am something of a bubbly aficionado. Um, it is my, I love it. And sparkling rosé just added to the overwhelming popularity of bubbles to begin with. The category of rosé prosecco only in this year has actually been legally viable. So there might have been pink bubbles from Italy, but there was no pink prosecco until this year. It was opposed by the consortium in Italy. Um, vigorously for a long time until they finally were able to, um, I think the money bears it out on their end to produce pink Prosecco. So there are sp some specific regulations they have to follow as well for what grapes they can use, uh, but pink Prosecco is now here. So that's also something that you will certainly be getting um, questions for. And, and sparkling wine, those brute sparkling wines, they're so beautiful to have on hand because they pair with rich foods, heavy foods, salty foods, fatty foods, and that applies to cheeses in terms of a range. You really can't go wrong with a nice dry sparkling wine and cheese, um, just such a wide range um, is what it really works nicely with. So the next big trend, and I could go on about sparkling wine. Um, so if you have more questions about the bubbles, uh, we can get to those in any of the other classes, um, is rosé. So unless you're living in a cave, you know that rosé rules right now. Uh, rosé doesn't just rule right now, it's been a trend over the last decade in the United States that has had double digit growth for imported rosés year on year. So you're thinking, well, I know that, I see rosés all the time. Rosé, and yet I think rosé still suffers a bit of an image problem um, in terms of the serious wine category, and it's still got that affiliation with White Zinfandel, which of course it has absolutely no connection to White Zinfandel whatsoever. Rosés have been around for centuries. Um, it is, they, they hail from Southern France initially. Um, it, it is what everyone drinks at lunchtime uh, for the most part. Um, they are made from red grapes. So they're made from grapes that wouldn't otherwise, wouldn't be destined for greatness in a beautiful, you know, uh, Cote de Rhone or a Bordeaux blend. They're grapes that are meant to be uh, harvested and fermented young and turned into these beautiful rosés. But it is, I always say, uh, rosé is red wine in a pink dress because you're using red grapes. What makes the wine pink, of course, is the, the skins of the, of the black and red skin grapes um, stain the juice for a brief period of time. And then they convert over to almost a white wine making process with what they have. So how long it ferments and the actual hue of the grapes is kind of what dictates the actual final color because rosés come in such a beautiful variety of hues of pink. Um, <clears throat> but as rosé has gotten more popular, the market has become a little more crowded. So I'm increasingly selective. I always say I'm not a wine snob. I never ever will have snobbery. But in terms of rosés, I've become more selective because you have to be. Um, too much rosé flooding the market leads to, you know, like I was saying earlier, a sort of a deterioration of quality. Mm -hmm. Uh, the under eights, for the most part, in terms of pricing, you know, those are bigger, more mainstream, mass marketed, a little more sugar in them as well. Um, not my personal favorites, uh, but again, these are bone dry rosés from southern France. Um, Spain has beautiful ones. Italy has beautiful ones for old world, and they really pair so so nicely with summer, with cheeses, with outdoors, with hot weather. Uh, they really are just um, so great and so. Um, so delicious. And you, at this point, I would recommend having, depending on the size of your store, if you're small, two to three, if you're big, five plus. I mean, anywhere you go right now, you can see these big rosé displays. And rosés tend to come in, in March to April. Uh, usually we're drinking a rosé that's got a one-year vintage date on it. It's a young wine. So it's 2021 right now, we're getting the 2020s in. 
Um, but what we've actually seen, uh, because last year, so many, there were so many problems during the pandemic with wine getting here um, and also wine just getting anywhere. Uh, what we saw was that a lot of places were stuck with the previous year's vintage and it drank just fine. So you will have reps that are trying to push the new on you, but if they have any of the old left, you can probably get it at a pretty good price. And all in all, it's going to, it's going to drink very well. Would I recommend a five-year-old vintage date on a rosé from Southern France? Uh, probably not. Um, but overall, I think that it's... Um, it's definitely something to keep your eye on. Now, um, our sponsor, King Estate, actually has a rosé of Pinot Noir that I recently tasted that is just heavenly. It's beautiful, crisp, and dry with sort of like that watermelon, lemon, citrusy note in there. Um, it's, it's, it's quite lovely. I was very happy with that one. I drink rosé year round though. I don't limit it to just the warm weather. And as rosé has grown in popularity, you're definitely seeing more rosés lasting through the year. So it is rosé season. So I'm going to shift over to something else that you're definitely going to be asked questions about. And this is organic, biodynamic, sustainable, and natural wines. All different approaches that are all sort of under a similar umbrella, I would say. Um, <clears throat> some people really want organic wine. Some people are interested in it. Some people have heard the term natural wine or biodynamic. And what does it mean? Is it any different? Is it good? Is it better? Um, organic, of course, has to follow USDA certifications in order to get that organic sticker on stamp on the bottle. And that essentially means that the winery has to follow organic practices the entire way through. There's also a term called made with organically grown grapes, which you might see. So the grapes themselves are produced organically, but not necessarily everything else in the vineyard or in the winery is, has to follow that. The big thing is no added sulfites. Um, all wine has naturally occurring sulfites. It's in the grapes themselves. You can't have no sulfites, but sulfites are added often by a winemaker um, for flavor, for preservation, for balance, for a number of reasons. It's it's the overuse of sulfites that's become the problem, but many winemakers use them responsibly um, and for balance, like I was saying. Biodynamics, um, that's really a philosophy that's sort of like everything in the universe is interconnected. And it's, it's like this wine, the biodynamic wines tend to have this really fantastic personality. There's a lot of pizzazz to these wines. Um, they there's a, if you noticed on the video, there's a Demeter um, certification that goes on to biodynamic wines. They tend to be organic. Uh, they are organic. Um, they can actually have up to 100 parts per million um, of sulfite. So they can add a little bit of sulfite in there. And there is a biodynamic calendar. They follow a variety of days, root date, flower days, um, leaf days, and fruit, root, flower, and leaf. Those are the days. Um, so there's, it's, it's a pretty intricate concept. What I have found is that wineries that are biodynamic, um, if I don't know they're biodynamic, I drink their wines and I think, wow, I love this wine. There's just so much there, it kind of pops on my palate. So, and then natural of course is a little bit more, there's, there's very little, there's nothing added. Uh, they follow or organic as well. Um, they tend to be unfiltered, they use native yeast. So they're, and they're gonna be a little bit cloudier. Um, natural wines tend to have a short shelf life, of course, once they're opened, um, so that you kind of have to drink it in one sitting, which isn't a problem often for many people, especially if there's two of you. So shifting over to packaging. Um, <clears throat> yes, there's bottles and they're fabulous and we love wine bottles, but these days, um, another thing that people are definitely looking for is alternate packaging. I have seen over the last five years, boxed wines skyrocket, not just in their actual presence, but in the quality of the wine. So a box of wine has four bottles of wine in it, a standard box. So I actually have one right here, just to hold up and show you. This is a box. It is so lightweight, this is full. There's four bottles of wine in there. When winemakers convert to box packaging, um, your global footprint goes down about 80%. No glass waste, and honestly, way too many um, establishments just throw out the glass. That's cardboard. It's got a tap system. The lining inside may or may not be degradable depending on where you are. You can recycle it or not. 
but in general, and for a long time, it was just sort of inexpensive wine that was in the boxes. Now we're seeing just fantastic wines. European wineries are getting in on this and their shipping costs, their freight, their, their use of, um, <clears throat> of, of their, their overall ability to ship and do things better is just so much greater for them. They can save so much money. They use so much less fuel when they have to um, put these on freights um, on, on the giant ships that come over. So it's really, I'm really happy with that. Also, um, that tap that's on the, the box of wine keeps the wine fresh. Now they'll tell you that a box of wine can stay fresh for four to six weeks. Um, it's only four bottles. It, it, there's no reason why a box of wine would last that long anywhere. The only dangerous part is there's no window on the side, so you can't see how much you're pouring. It's very easy to fill a glass and fill a glass and fill a glass. Um, but <laughs> And then all of a sudden there's, it's empty. Um, so white wines, rosés, and red wines, I'm seeing really good stuff coming in um, for those. Cans, uh, another, I have a little can of wine right here. Again, I'm not a snob. I think they're fantastic for beaches, for boating, uh, for being by the pool. If you don't want glass, use a plastic wine glass. Um, what's happened as well though, in terms of the can concept is that the quality has increased tremendously over the last few years. So when the cans kind of happened, there's a lining in there. There's a lot of technology inside of this, but originally, you know, they were kind of like one-offs and then a trend really took root and people really loved this concept. So um, the, the can is definitely something that's here to stay. It may not necessarily fit into the philosophy of your store, um, but I, I really say if, if you have them, um, if you taste some and you like them, then, then they come in little four packs, they come individuals for, you know, individual sale for them and all around. They're, they're fun, they're unpretentious, um, they're good. And I'd say that my, preferences would be for rosés and whites, but I have had a couple of yummy, um, easy drinking light reds as well. And then shifting over to package to another part of packaging, um, twist offs. So I don't have a twist off with me today, but twist off versus plastic versus natural cork. There's still this idea, I think that, um, Although twist offs are as common as ever and on easily half the wines that I think most of us encounter on a routine basis that it's still like, is it really good wine if it has a, a, a twist off on it. Um, absolutely. So the issue arose a long time ago because um, there's a taint that's a very long chemical compound but the abbreviation is TCA, and that can get into a cork and then it gets into the wine and it renders it undrinkable. It's not going to make you sick it's just it's bad. Um, everyone's had a bad bottle of wine. You peel the foil off, you pull the cork out. Either there's wine that's bled up through the cork, the cork crumbles right away, you pour it in your glass, it's bubbling, it's changed colors, it's brown. You know right away that that's bad wine. The problem is, is that wine doesn't go bad overnight. It's sort of like milk. It can take a few days to go actually off. In the beginning stages, wine can have just a little bit of funk. It can be a little musty. Most people that are drinking those wines don't realize that. What they usually realize is this wine doesn't taste the way that I remember it to taste. So when they either buy it at a store or they have it at a restaurant, we tend to not send things like that back. What happens instead is you finish it and then you buy something different. That's untrackable loss. And that number is pretty high. Um, you know, I would say it's between seven to 10% of wine is spoiled, but they don't know about that because when you send that bottle back, it goes all the way back to the winery and they can track that in terms of the taint and the loss. So they've, there's synthetic corks. That was the first go around, what had to combat this. Cause you know, high-end wineries are, are tired of losing these, these amazing wines to this taint, which is invisible of course, until you want to taste it. So um, plastic corks are fine if the wine is young. They really don't allow oxygen to get in. It's not permeable. So if it's a one or two year old wine, the synthetic cork is okay. The big issue of course, is when you pull synthetic corks out for the most part, you cannot get them back in the bottle. Um, it's not a problem for a lot of people, again, drinking it in an, in an evening, but um, if you do wanna recork it, it's pretty challenging. So the twist off has been the answer. It has what's called a stelvin on the inside. So that's the, the Stelvin is the technology that's inside that cap. Um, you can peel it out. It looks like a wafer thin disc. 
And that is the technology that allows wines to live, to breathe, to age for years and years and years. Um, there's a famous house in Bordeaux right now that's been conducting a decade plus long study on its Bordeaux with twist offs. When we blind taste them, when people have had these blind tasted against wines that have the cork finishes, they are better. Also, not, that's not to say all of them will, and there will always be cork enthusiasts who just can't see their way to the twist off. Um, they keep wine fresh longer once it's opened. Um, you can turn it on its side. You can travel with it a little better if it's opened. But really the big one is once you open a bottle of wine, if you reseal it with that twist off, it will stay fresh two to three times longer. Absolutely no problem than a wine that has a cork finish on it. And that applies to reds and whites. Um, if you open a white wine with a cork and you let it sit in your fridge for maybe a week when you drink it, it's not going to taste good, especially if there's a lot of oxygen in the bottle. If you do the same with a twist off and you've resealed it tightly and put it back in the fridge, it's going to be fresh. It's going to taste fine after a week um, for the most part. It, it's it's not, not all of them translate, but I would say definitely we're going to, you're going to be happy with that. Um, and the same goes for the reds as well. So that's, um, I'm a big fan of the twist off. Um, the big, the, the big um, hang up I think is when people go to restaurants and they order a $140 bottle of wine and it has a twist off, um, a server has to do a little more than just crack a cap. Um, <laughs> you present the bottle and go away, but you should never be given a twist off to um, investigate yourself. You don't wanna smell it either. But in terms of retail, of course, um, twist offs are just fine. And again, uh, they're really fantastic for um, storing wines. And for once they're open, they stay fresh for so much longer. So I don't have a ton of time left um, before we get to our tasting. So a quick note about sulfites and oak. Um, I didn't really get to talk too much about the Chardonnay and the oaking, but people say to me all the time, so I can't have wine with sulfites. I'm allergic to sulfites. I have a sulfite allergy, reaction to sulfites. If you can eat a handful of raisins or a couple of apricots and you don't have anything happen to you, it isn't sulfites. Um, <clears throat> there's also sulfites in white wines. So usually what I hear from people is that this reaction happens when they drink red wines. So all wine has naturally occurring sulfites. Like I was saying earlier, they are added often, um, but you can't have it 100% without it. So in all likelihood, if, if you are allergic to raisins and, and apricots and dried fruits, then definitely it's, it's most likely sulfites. But um, it's probably, they, they've sort of narrowed this down to, it's likely some form of a histamine that's in the skins, in the, in the seeds, the skins, the stems uh, that they haven't quite isolated yet. Um, and another big culprit is oaking. So oaking wine, of course, means that the, the wine is fermenting in oak barrels. And if you have an oak allergy, that could be a big contributor. Unfortunately, oaking is also something that in this country, um, you are allowed to do synthetically. So when I was talking earlier about those big mass produced wines, uh, when people want wine on demand, they don't wanna wait a long time for it. So unfortunately, winemakers will often accelerate the process by synthetic oaking. And that means that you are fermenting the wine in a giant ceramic vat or stainless steel even, and they, are allowed, they use oak chips or oak powder to enhance it. To me, I've been able to pick up on those nuances. I, to, it has a definite woody, like almost a splintery taste to it. And I can tell over time, there's wines that I used to have a long time ago that I can tell the difference now that they've shifted over to this. It doesn't bother a lot of people. Um, it's not harmful per se. It's just a different a way to make wine and speed up that process um, because of that mass marketing need. Now, um, there are many wineries, of course, in the United States that would never dream of doing such a thing. Um, but, you know, it, like I was saying, and mass produced wines aren't just from the United States either. Uh, they come from, you know, all over the world, but uh, they are, there they are. So, so I see that it's 441. I'm on a clock here. I'm happy to uh, address any of these topics in more depth in the next classes, or if you want to send questions as well. Um, because there's just so much to cover for Wine 101. Um, and again, the more that you know, you can, the more you're able to sell because you could have uh, the most fabulous, amazing dynamic selection of wines in your store, but if you aren't comfortable selling it, 
Um, if you don't have some fun facts, some history of the wineries and things like that, then you're, you're not going to be comfortable. Your staff aren't going to be comfortable and your customers aren't. And then everyone's going to revert to doing what I call is buying safe. You're just going to buy what you know. You're going to sell the easiest thing instead of, you know, you clearly want to take the time to build a nice wine program. So um, that's why we have this sort of building block process to doing this. And we'll address a lot more in the next class. So now we're going to do our um, wine and cheese pairing. Perhaps you've already started. Maybe you started at four o'clock. If you did, good for you. <laughs> so we have, I'll do the, um, I will actually do the Sancerre first. So as I was saying earlier, remember Sancerre is Sauvignon Blanc, um, but you could also find a beautiful Loire Valley Sauvignon Blanc that isn't in, necessarily in that high of a price point. And here on my cork, I do have Mise en Bouteille dans nos caves. So there it is. That's an old rolled cork. Here's my glass. So have your cracker, dry your palate out a little bit. Um, <clears throat> for the cheese, for the cheese that we have here today, I had suggested a young chevre. This is sort of a classic pairing. And there's this adage that what grows together goes together. Um, it's not the only rule, of course, when it comes to pairing um, wine and food. But in this instance, having something from the Loire Valley alongside the wine from the Loire Valley goes really nicely together. You're going to, they're going to um, work beautifully together. So I usually like to catch some of those beautiful aromas. Mm, get a little lemon, a little grass. So beautiful. One of my favorite words for wine, beautiful. <laughs> and then for the cheese, you can go ahead. So I usually suggest taking a sip of the wine by itself. Get that flavor inside of your mouth. Then have a taste of the cheese. And the cheese that we have here today is um, we actually picked up the Sage Farm goat cheese, a young and fresh I'll hold this up so everyone can see. It's the cheese on the front right there. Take a sip of wine, have a bite of cheese, have them together. Have it on Christine if you'd like to. So what this does is, mine's a little soupy. I'm, not, I'm actually not going to. It's a little runny right now. So the way that this works is that this goat cheese tends to be a blank slate. So the Sancerre with its bright acidity, heavy minerality component to it, and that yummy citrus really infuses the goat cheese with personality, with flavor, so that they work well together in concert. Um, they are, so that something about the Loire Valley that's noteworthy is what I, two terms I just referenced. One is minerality and one is acidity. So minerality is a very common phrase that gets bandied about in the, in the wine world. Um, I like to use it a lot too, but what does minerality actually mean? <clears throat> it comes from the soil. And if you think about chalk, if you think about sort of like what copper pennies might taste like, um, limestone, those are all different components that make minerality sort of this way. It's, it's that beautiful when you drink this nice, crisp, dry white wine and you get that kind of really nice note in your cheeks. And then there's the acidity that comes in as well. So acidity, of course, makes it a little bit sharper. That's then softened, softened with the cheese. And this again is considered a classic pairing. So in terms of pairings, Congruent pairings are pairings that have similar compounds, uh, beef and mushrooms, for example, um, and those usually go with red wines. Complementary are contrasting compounds. Whites, rosés, and sparkling wines tend to work best with opposites attract in a way. What I was talking earlier about sparkling wine, champagne going with really rich fatty foods, the saltiness, um, they work together to create this powerful, this beautiful sort of explosion of flavor. And that's what I get with the Sancerre. Now, again, Sancerre is a beautiful wine you can drink on its own. But in this instance, this with the um, goat cheese is just a, a 
a heavenly combination. Um, you could just have that for dinner, in my opinion. <laughs> so um, put that to the side. Now we'll have, now I had recommended Havarti to have with your rosé. Um, the reason I had recommended the, the Havarti um, was because the crisp dry red fruit notes of the rosé kind of go nicely with that sort of mellow, buttery, semi-soft. Um, I'm gonna, oh, actually one other closure I forgot to mention, which is trendy and it's not my favorite, is a glass cork. It's a, it's a stopper. Um, the reason I don't love it is it, it, like I said, it's very chic right now and you pretty much only see it on rosés. I don't love it because when you're opening the bottle, I get a little worried about the glass around the edge, um, which of course you never want to have any kind of chipping. Um, and this doesn't seal it. So now that this rosé is opened, oh well, we have to drink it all because you, you can reseal it, but you can't put it on its side. Um, it will leak out. So to that end, um, but they're pretty. And I think people in general, consumers tend to like them. Um, but for efficiency, they're not the best. So I have a rosé. I chose one from Southern France. I have a Cote de Provence. So Provence, of course, is the most popular region for rosé. Um, within Provence, you have the AIX, the um, Ion Provence. You have the Cote de Provence, smaller and smaller. And I was saying earlier about sort of being a little more selective. Um, I love Cote de Provence um, for my Southern Provencal rosés. I also love rosés from the Languedoc, um, which doesn't have the, the prestige necessarily, but that also means it doesn't have the price tag. So you can actually feature some really nice rosés um, at, at a pretty good price. Um, so this with the Havarti, take your sip of your rosé. And then your Havarti, like I was saying, that's that's sort of an interesting pairing that I had come up with, but um, my cheese gurus here with Culture Magazine also recommended um, a sheep's milk. So we have the Tom Brule sheep's milk um, cheese, as, which is a harder cheese to go with rosé. Um, I also recommend feta mozzarella, mozzarella and cheddars with rosé too. Um, it's, it's a pretty, rosé tends to be a pretty cheese friendly, um, you can just make a nice cheese board and sample it. It's, it's, it's an easy to pair wine, um, in, in my opinion. And again, due to its popularity, if you're stocking a few of these, uh, maybe from different regions, a couple of French, an American, and perhaps an Italian or a Spanish, You'll have a nice array and you could even recommend like a four rosé and four cheese pairing option to your customers too. And rosés again, like I was saying earlier that the sort of mass marketed more mainstream ones are now in the under $8 range. Um, I'm looking, usually I'm looking at a price point of about 12 to $17 for a rosé. Um, some of them, the celebrity branded rosés because that's another really big trend. Of course it is. Um, the celebrity branded ones are very popular because of the name on the bottle, not necessarily the contents inside. Uh, so beware of that when you see, um, when, when you are asked to try celebrity wines. But you know what, your customers might really want it. Um, so that's, you know, give them what they want then. And look at me, I'm so on time today. So it's 4.50, um, now we have questions? Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> Um, could Maya repeat the four grapes she suggested as ones to focus on? This is really great information. Maya is so knowledgeable about wine. Thank you so much. Okay, so the core four, Sauvignon Blanc, um, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Cabernet Sauvignon. And the reason I said those four as the core four are because those are grapes that can grow globally and produce wine of equally high quality. You can have a world-class Chardonnay from Napa. In fact, the Judgment of Paris 1976 wine competition proved that. The Chateau Montalena took top honors for the white wine, which is a Chardonnay. Or you can have a world-class white Burgundy. And Burgundy is, I could teach a course just on Burgundy and the Chardonnays of Burgundy. Um, if you're drinking Chablis, 
Petit Chablis or Macon, those are unoaked Chardonnays and they have a completely different personality. Chardonnay is kind of a chameleon that really can take on the characteristics of its environment. Um, you can have gorgeous Chardonnays from South America, from New Zealand, uh, from Spain and from Italy. So that's, it's just, it's such a powerhouse. And it's, I would say arguably the most popular grape in sales in the world. And then there's some people that just like their oaky buttery California Chardonnay, and that's great too. And you'll have a lot of customers like that that want some good cheeses to go with that style as well. I personally um, love Chablis. It's an unoaked Chardonnay from Northern Burgundy. It's really what Chardonnay tastes like in its true identity. No oak influence, a lot of minerality. Um, the soil is filled with fossils that are millions of years old that are primarily oyster shells. So that's why it's such a great oyster pairing. When they till that soil, that all that beautiful um, oyster note comes up, you get a little bit of salinity in there and it's just so heavenly with oysters. Um, so that's my recommendation. Sauvignon Blanc again with the Sancerre, the Loire Valley is its, is its true home. Its spiritual home is in the Loire, um, but it makes beautiful wines in California it makes beautiful wines in uh, South America, especially right now, seeing some great Sauvignon Blancs coming out of there too. Pinot Noir, one of the most popular grapes in the world at the moment. Um, incredibly beautiful wines that come out of the Willamette Valley in Oregon, but Oregon in general is definitely where it's at right now for Pinot Noir production. Um, and our sponsor produces some absolutely phenomenal King State Pinot Noirs. And then, uh, but if you're drinking a Burgundy, it's Pinot Noir as well. And you can have Pinot Noirs from other countries too. Cabernet Sauvignon, of course, the cab is the king. Napa cabs, cult cabs, um, you can't go wrong with those. And then there's a whole range of Cabernets and then of course the Bordeaux component for those. So for today's class, I was primarily trying to address sort of the current trends and areas that you would wanna be focusing on as you build a wine program. Um, uh, there are, just so many aspects to to building this, but you don't want to miss out on some of these, no matter what your store's philosophy is. So, and then of course, although I did mention those core four, um, I'm going to leave you on one little interesting, fun tidbit note. Um, probably more, maybe not as useful as drinking wine at 8 a.m., but still very interesting. When I was talking earlier about the difference between white Zinfandel and rosé, although they share the color pink, uh, they have nothing in common. White Zinfandel was an accidental creation. And I love to tell people this story. It actually happened in California in the 1970s. A winery was experimenting with Zinfandel, which you're all familiar most likely with Zinfandel, which creates a big, bold, spicy red wine. They were trying to make a white wine from the red wine grape, the red grapes. Um, their fermentation process got stuck. So the yeast stopped eating the sugar and stopped converting it to alcohol. So when they went back to check the wine, it had stuck. Instead of restarting the fermentation process, they realized it was about a 2% sugar level, which is very high. They tasted it. They thought, whew, they might not have loved it themselves, but they realized pretty quickly that this would cater to a very specific um, demographic and a huge one at that. They went to their marketing department. They had to lobby pretty hard. They said, we have the next blue nun, um, if you know what that is. Um, marketing went with it and that was Sutter Home. So that was the launch of this. I mean, by 1987, it was like the best selling wine in this country, I believe. It went on to become a powerhouse. Again, if you're a rosé lover, you don't like white Zinfandel. If you're a white Zinfandel lover, you don't like dry rosé. A lot of people look down on white Zin. They dismiss it, they don't carry it. Restaurants might carry it, but don't put it on their list anymore. Um, it's a gateway. It was, it was my gateway. It was the wine I drank in the tiny little bottles with the screw caps on the top uh, in my early twenties. Um, and I thought I was very sophisticated and I loved drinking wine like this. And I realized pretty quickly that it was way too sweet and the hangover wasn't nearly yeah. worth it. But I shifted over to, um, wine, it opened up the world of wine to me. So to that end, I have to credit White Zinfandel with, with, with opening wine up to me. So, 
So um, I think we're out of time. We apologize for the technical difficulties. <laughs> and we will have uh, more questions for next time. As Susan mentioned, please feel free to email them um, if you have some, some big stumbling blocks that you really would like to have answered. And um, I will see everybody back here for um, the second session of our wine program next week. It's been a pleasure talking to everybody. And thank you to our sponsor, King Estate Winery, and to uh, Cheval Restaurant in Portland.